Thank you very much indeed, Peter, for that lovely introduction. Now you're in for it. <laughs> Ninety years ago, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Menzies delivered a memorable address for what was then the Australian Broadcasting Commission as the introduction to a debate on the question, Is Democracy Doomed? I love that word, doomed. It sounds so good with a Scottish accent. <laughs> We're doomed. Well, nearly a century later, many people, not least anxious observers of the uh, American presidential election that will conclude in just 13 days' time, are asking the very same question. Trump is speaking like Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini, wrote my old friend Anne Applebaum in The Atlantic this week. He and his campaign team believe that by using the tactics of the 1930s, they can win, she argued. With the campaign now in its penultimate week, the Democratic candidate Kamala Harris only occasionally goes this far. For example, when a radio interviewer described Trump's political vision as fascism, Harris replied, yes, we can say that. More often, Harris prefers just to question Trump's mental stability. The Harris campaign's most frequently aired ad in Nevada features two of Trump's former advisers describing him as unstable. Last week, Harris described, accused Trump of being exhausted. Donald Trump is not cognitively fit to be president, was the way Ezra Klein summed it up in the New York Times today. Trump's Derangement was the headline of Joan Walsh's recent column in The Nation. Yet this line of attack, ladies and gentlemen, has a rather obvious weakness. Until July the 21st, the man who is currently President of the United States was repeatedly described by Democratic cheerleaders as being as sharp as a tack. It was only on that day that former President Barack Obama called Joe Biden at his home in Delaware and told him, and I quote, here's the deal. We have Kamala's approval to invoke the 25th Amendment, which would have meant declaring Biden unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. From that moment onwards, Biden went from being as sharp as a tack to being as politically dead as a doornail. The awkward thing is that while he was defenestrated as the Democratic nominee, he is still president. You might have forgotten that. And it's rather hard to persuade undecided voters that Donald Trump is cognitively less fit to be president than the current occupant of the White House. Now, pro-Harris uh, pro journalists know this, which is why they keep falling back on the old Trump is Hitler line. The latest example is a piece just published by Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic under the headline, Trump, I need the kind of generals that Hitler had. It's unfortunate that the anecdote with which Goldberg opens his essay depicting Trump as indifferent to the feelings of relatives of the murdered army private Vanessa Guillen, was almost immediately repudiated by three people who were present, including her sister. It's even more unfortunate for the Democrats that research by the Centre for Working Class Politics, which, as you can tell from its name, is not a conservative institution, shows that this whole line of argument is almost entirely ineffective in changing the minds of registered voters. I was wrong. I thought on January the 6th, 2021, that Donald Trump's political career was at an end. The reality is 
that regardless of how nefariously he behaved on that day, the Democrats have failed to persuade around half of likely voters that his conduct revealed him to be a Hitler-like threat to democracy. Indeed, January the 6th may well have failed to discredit Trump precisely because the first attempt to do so over his alleged collusion with the Russian government in 2016 turned out to be, as Trump would say, fake news. You see, crying wolf has these well-known disadvantages. The context of our current debate of course, is very different from the one in which Robert Menzies spoke. Australia in 1934 was still in the grip of the Great Depression, the single biggest economic crisis of the industrial era. It was the severity of the Depression that made democracy seem so vulnerable in the 30s. But Menzies argued against that view. His message was that democracy depended not on a sense of entitlement to prosperity, but rather on a sense of obligation. And I'm going to quote Menzies here. The greatest danger to democracy, he said, lies in the readiness of the popular elector to be satisfied with low standards of government, to be bribed by promises of political and pecuniary advantages, Indeed, nothing is more disappointing to the political idealist than to see how frequently the only standard of judgment applied by the voter is, what is there in this for me? By contrast, Menzies said, democracy's ultimate effective exercise calls for a motive force which can be supplied only by widespread interest in the problems of government. The good Democrat is not the man who prates loudly of his rights, but the man who realizes that the social contract which binds any society together is one expressed primarily in terms of duties and obligations. The majority would not always be right Menzies acknowledged. Here he is again. Indeed, since ignorance is more prevalent and frequently more vocal than knowledge, and since misrepresentation is all too commonly the chief weapon of the controversialist, all the chances are that at first, at the first time of asking, the majority will be wrong. But the great quality of democracy is that it is flexible and responsive to changed opinion, and lends itself really to that process of trial and error by which progress comes and truth prevails. Now, as a Scotsman, I feel a strong sense of kinship with the man who wrote these words. Menzies' grandfather was born in Greenock in Renfrewshire, married the daughter of a cobbler from Dercy in Fife, which is where my grandfather, John Ferguson, hailed from. Menzies, in fact, preferred his surname to be pronounced in the traditional Scottish manner, Mingus, which was the original of the nickname Ming the Merciless. Like my grandfather, like all my grandparents, Menzies, I'll stick with Menzies because that's what you're used to, Menzies was a passionate believer in social mobility through education. Unlike my paternal grandfather, Menzies didn't fight in the First World War, something his enemies never tired of pointing out, but that was the result of a family decision to keep one of the three Menzies brothers out of the trenches. Menzies appeals during his lifetime, during his time in the political wilderness, to the forgotten people still resonates today. As Prime Minister after the war, he presided over important steps to liberalise Australian political life, as Troy Bramston shows in his recent and excellent biography. True, Menzies' views on racial matters don't read very well today. Nevertheless, the Australia we see around us today still bears his imprint and the voices raised in hostility to King Charles's visit this week 
have been notable as much for their irrelevance as for their shrillness. (laughs) Democracy turned out not to be doomed in the 1930s then. Thanks to Robert Menzies' generation, it survived the Great Depression. But it wasn't a sure thing in 1934. Just a year later, the American author Sinclair Lewis published It Can't Happen Here. Anybody read it? A prize to that lady. (laughs) Everyone should read this book. Because in it, Lewis imagined an unscrupulous demagogue, actually a democratic senator named Buzz Windrip, which is a good name, being elected president and swiftly turning the United States into a fascist regime complete with paramilitary thugs called Minutemen and a Goebbels-like sidekick. This is a book I recommend to anyone who believes that Trump is the fulfillment of Sinclair's dystopian premonition. Moreover, democracy in the 30s also had to fight for its survival in the most destructive war in history. And it was very far from guaranteed when that war began in 1939 that the democracies would prevail. Indeed, victory over the Axis powers, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy and Imperial Japan, came only after Hitler made the fatal mistake of attacking not only the Soviet Union, but also the United States. Remember, the Allied side that won the Second World War was not a pure coalition of democracies. For Stalin was one of the big three. And the price he demanded for the Red Army's role in Hitler's defeat was paid at Yalta and thereafter by the peoples in Eastern Europe and elsewhere who were condemned to live under communist dictatorship. Well, by comparison, our generation has been fortunate to have been spared a Great Depression. Indeed, so creative have our central bankers and finance ministers become in the past two decades that we're beginning to forget what a recession is like. And yet, despite the sustained economic growth we've enjoyed, there still seem reasons to fear for the health of democracy around the world. For the past few years, my Hoover Institution colleague Larry Diamond has been warning of a democratic recession. Each year, the non-profit Freedom House publishes its Freedom in the World report. The latest edition states, and I quote, that global freedom declined for the 18th consecutive year in 2023. These and similar assessments remind me of Fareed Zakaria's warning way back in 1997 that the future would belong to illiberal democracy. Well, as everybody knows, democracy was invented in ancient Athens in the 5th century BC. But only in the past century has it been widely and durably adopted as a form of government? Why, you ask yourselves, was democracy previously so short-lived? Why were the democracies prior to the modern era ephemeral? The answer is because classical and Renaissance political philosophy taught that democracy was inherently unstable. The rule of the people was an ephemeral staging post between aristocracy and monarchy or tyranny. Now, this was a great concern of America's founding fathers, which was why they were so careful to separate and limit the powers of the branches of government in their constitution. Even in the 19th century, the great French political theorist Alexis de Tocqueville regarded the United States as exceptional, not just because of the Constitution, but also because of the vigor of American religious and associational life. Tocqueville's conclusion 
was that democracy could never work in France because too many of his compatriots preferred equality to liberty. And that was why they ended up with a Napoleon twice. Let's look at the world today. About half of all countries are democracies. According to the Varieties of Democracy Project at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, 90 of the 178 countries for which data were available in 2022 recently held truly free and fair multi-party elections. The oldest democracies in the world, all over a century old, are Switzerland, followed by Australia, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, the UK, the US, Canada, and Sweden. In other words, long-lived democracy is an Anglophone and Nordic phenomenon. In my view, Switzerland should be disqualified, by the way, for not allowing women to vote until 1971. So, in fact, this country is the oldest true democracy. You should be proud of that. Here's an amazing thing. Only 24 democracies are more than 60 years old. 20 are less than 19 years old. What's more, of those 90 or so democracies, only 32, a third, qualify as liberal democracies. That is to say, they not only allow all adults to vote, but they also protect civil and political liberties through such vitally important institutions as independent courts and a free press, and I might add, think tanks like the Robert Menzies Institute. That's liberal democracy. It's not just about voting. Now, from a high of 44 back in 2007 or thereabouts, the number of liberal democracies has actually fallen. It's down to 32, as I said. Illiberal democracies, they have elections but not much else, are up from 46 in 2007 to 59 today. But electoral autocracies like Vladimir Putin's Russia, which have elections but though they're a sham, those have actually declined in number from 63 in 2013 to 54, while the pure autocracies think Saudi Arabia, are actually up from 23 in 2018 to 34 now. Now, of course, some countries, as you are well aware, are very large and some are very small. So it's really more meaningful, isn't it, to look at shares of the world's population living under these different regimes. As predicted by Fareed Zakaria, the proportion of people in liberal democracies has indeed fallen from a secular high of 17% back in the period 1993 to 2011 to just 13% last year. However, as not predicted by Fareed, the share in the illiberal democracies is down even further from 37% to 16%. The share in electoral autocracies, meanwhile, is up hugely from 17% in 2001 to 44%, well, the share in the outright autocracies is also up from 23% to 27%. So these data would seem to confirm the Larry Diamond thesis of a democratic recession, if not actually a democratic depression. But are they to be trusted? Remember, this is political science, and that's an oxymoron. As India is now certainly the world's most populous country and certainly its most populous democracy, it kind of matters how India is classified. And this is where it gets quite interesting. Any Indians here? All right. Well, this is the key to understanding if democracy is winning, losing, in recession, doomed. So one set of political scientists say that India has been an electoral autocracy since 2017, 
with civil and political rights as limited as they were during Indira Gandhi's state of emergency back in the mid-1970s. But other political scientists disagree. There's one data set that classifies India as a straight-up democracy. Freedom House downgraded India to partly free two years ago, but actually 66 out of 100 is not a terrible score when neighbouring Pakistan is on 35. And the Economist Intelligence Unit, I checked today, has this modest decline in India's democratic score from 7.9 out of a possible 10 in 2014 to 7.2 in 2023. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, All these indices of democracy that you read about should be taken not just with a pinch of salt, but with all the salt you have in this room. Just don't buy this stuff. It is, I think, pseudoscience. It boils down to this. Whether you think liberal democracy is in some kind of global crisis depends entirely on your opinion of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. That's it. There's another quirk of democracy which I think Robert Menzies would have appreciated. One of the more remarkable features of the modern world, which I don't think any of the great thinkers of the 18th and 19th century would have expected, is the persistence of monarchy. Now, the US media love portraying the UK as quaintly eccentric for still having a hereditary king. It's always worth a few cheap laughs in the New York Times. But the reality is that it must be said, non-constitutional monarchies can be found all over the world. Today, 43 sovereign nation states have a monarch, of which the majority are democracies, including 15 members of the Commonwealth that, like Australia, have Charles III as their head of state. In Europe, Belgium, Denmark... Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, and Sweden, all are monarchies. In short, there are plenty of liberal democracies, more than 30, even if a surprising number of them turn out to be monarchies rather than republics. And while they're not all that populous, they are rich. If you add up the gross domestic products of all the countries that have provided aid to Ukraine in the past two and a half years, it's roughly half of global GDP. And that ought to suffice, you might think, to keep the doom of democracy at bay. The problem is that, as was true in the 1930s, It may not suffice. In an essay last year, the New York Times, as David Leonhardt argued, and I quote, if the US embraced only those countries with purer democratic records than India, it would not be able to create a very powerful global alliance. The US, Canada, Western Europe, Japan, and South Korea are not strong enough to dominate the world as they once could. Did you notice He forgot Australia. On the other side, ladies and gentlemen, as has become increasingly clear over the past two years, is a new axis that is in many ways more formidable than the one that emerged before and during the Second World War. Russia is waging its war on Ukraine with growing material assistance not only from China, but also from Iran and North Korea. I've called it the axis of ill will to distinguish it from the fictitious axis of evil dreamt up by David Frum for George W. Bush way back in 2002. It's well known that Chinese exports to Russia, predominantly but not only dual-use hardware that can be used for military production, have roughly doubled since the war in Ukraine began and that Iran has been supplying Moscow with both drones and missiles, less noticed is the amount of material coming to Russia from North Korea. By mid-2024, Pyongyang had supplied Russia with up to 4.8 million shells and rockets. 
from its stockpiles as well as ballistic missiles. And now we learn that North Korean troops are on their way to the battlefields of Ukraine. Yes, on paper, Allied support for Ukraine has been generous. If you look at the latest Ukraine support tracker from the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, between January 2022 and June 2024, around 40 countries together made bilateral commitments to Ukraine, totaling $334 billion. But only $218 billion of that sum has actually been allocated, and military allocations of hardware have fallen by more than a third in the past 12 months. I was in Kyiv six weeks ago. The mood of bitterness is growing in that country. If you compare the effort made when Saddam Hussein sought to annex Kuwait in 1990, it's quite striking. Relative to gross domestic product, Germany spent more than three times more on the liberation of Kuwait than it is spending on liberating Ukraine. And Kuwait was anything but a democracy. Total allocated aid from Germany to Ukraine amounts to just 0.37% of GDP. For the US, the figure's 0.35%. For France, it's 0.16%. For Italy, it is 0.11%. There's no excuse for this when the Baltic states and Denmark have all allocated more than 1% of GDP. Were Donald Trump to be re-elected, as I've already shown, his critics foresee a threat to the constitutional order, but they also foresee a threat to the liberal international order. In a second Trump term, it's often argued, I hear it every day, Trump would pull the plug on support for Ukraine. So the crux of the question before us is democracy doomed, is the American election. If Trump's critics are right, and he is Buzz Windrip, then democracy may well be doomed. Not only in the United States, but also in the wider world, beginning in Eastern Europe. I said at the beginning of this year that the U.S. election was like a choice between republic and empire. By that I meant that if you believe Trump poses a threat to the republic, you must vote for the democratic candidate. But if you believe that the democratic candidate poses a threat to American primacy in the world, then you must vote for Trump. It's a very Roman dilemma. Republic or empire. Now, I accept that as Trump's former chief of staff, General John Kelly, said this week, President Trump has no great respect for the Constitution or the law, though I think to say that he falls into the general definition of fascist, which is what General Kelly said, goes too far. But ladies and gentlemen, the question is not how far Trump has authoritarian proclivities. The question is how far he would be able to indulge them if re-elected to a second term. That's the question. So the question I keep asking, to which I have yet to receive a good answer, is uh, how exactly would Trump change the Constitution to give himself a third term, something unambiguously ruled out by the 22nd Amendment? Tell me how. Here's another one. Suppose... As in his first term, Trump sought to change U.S. immigration policy by executive order, but the court struck down his order. What would he do, what could he do, if the Supreme Court upheld the initial court ruling against him? And finally, what if Trump did order the U.S. military to take action against domestic political opponents? Where is the evidence anywhere that senior echelons of the U.S. Army would be willing to carry out such an order. 
Let me put it another way. There is no aspect of the Republican platform that envisions any change to the Constitution. If elected, Trump would seek to extend the soon-to-expire tax cuts of his first term, and he might seek to repeal the Inflation Reduction Act, though these have been so beneficial to red states that it's hard to see any good political reasons for doing that. He would use executive authority to enact new tariffs, strengthen border security, and exert greater control over executive agencies. The Schedule F executive order, which was originally issued in late 2020, then reversed by the Biden administration, would allow him to fire at will roughly 50,000 civil service positions. But none of this, none of this is remotely unconstitutional. The irony is that it's not Trump but the more radical Democrats who openly discuss constitutional changes that would fundamentally alter the U.S. political system to their own advantage. Give you just one example of many. In an article published a couple of years ago in the New York Times, two liberal professors at respectively Harvard and Yale, Ryan Durfler and Samuel Moyne, urged Democrats not to try to reclaim the, quote, broken constitution, but to, quote, radically alter the basic rules of the game. It's difficult, they wrote, to find a constitutional basis for abortion or labor unions in a document written by largely affluent men more than two centuries ago. It would be far better if liberal legislators could simply make a case for abortion and labor rights on their own merits without having to bother with the constitution. Oh, it gets better. Quote, In democracy, majority rule always must matter most, they declared. It should not have to, quote, survive vetoes from powerful minorities that invoke the constitutional past to obstruct a new future. A new way of fighting within American democracy must start with a more open politics of altering our fundamental law, perhaps in the first place, by making the Constitution more amendable than it is now. So what did Durfler and Moyne have in mind precisely, you may ask yourselves? Quote, One way to get to this more democratic world, they wrote, is to pack the union with new states. In order to break the false deadlock that the Constitution imposes through the Electoral College and Senate on the country, in which substantial majorities are foiled, foiled on issue after issue. Alternatively, and I quote, Congress could simply pass a Congress Act, reorganizing our legislature in ways that are more fairly representative of where people actually live and vote, and perhaps even reducing the Senate to a mere council of revision without the power to obstruct laws. In this way, our professors concluded, quote, the basic structure of government, like whether to elect the president by my, by my majority vote or to limit judges to fixed terms, would be decided by the present electorate as opposed to one from some foggy past, end quote. To anyone who reveres the U.S. Constitution, as I do as an American citizen, the most successful political document in the history of mankind, all of this is blood-curdling. It is nothing less than a call for revolution, for replacement of the American Republic with a unicameral tyranny of the majority. Here, it seems to me, is a much more explicit threat to the Constitution than Donald Trump's erratic personality, as interpreted by Democratic journalists and former officials Trump once fired. And who is to say that if elected with majorities in the Senate and the House, Vice President Harris would not be open to such revolutionary schemes? <laughs>
do away with the Senate filibuster, which Harris has said she would do to enact a federal right to abortion, and the opportunities also to pack the Supreme Court and add Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia as new and reliably blue states, each with two senators, would be kind of tempting, wouldn't it? The, three, the threats, the real threats to democracy, take other forms too. Let me revive an old question that political scientists used to ask back in the 1970s. Is there a political economy of democratic self-destruction via excessive debt and inflation? With deficits in excess of 5% of GDP, as far as the eye can see, it's worth recalling that history has very few examples of great powers that stayed great for long after the costs of debt service exceeded the costs of defense as they have in the United States this year for the first time. That, more than Trump's alleged Russophilia, is the real problem for America's allies, including, by the way, Australia. On its current trajectory, which I assume would continue under a Harris presidency, US defense spending simply does not suffice simultaneously to defend Ukraine, Israel, and also Taiwan if all three are under attack from the axis of, will, of ill will. I'll go further. On its current trajectory, the foreign policy of the Biden-Harris administration, which is what they called it from the outset, remember, likely condemns Ukraine to be defeated, Israel to risk a war against Iran with only limited U.S. support, and Taiwan to fear a blockade by China at some point in the next four years. The signature term of this administration's foreign policy has been de-escalation. It's only recently that I have figured out that this term is the functional opposite of deterrence. Now, we don't know, and we can't know, if Trump is right when he says that the attacks on Ukraine and Israel would not have occurred if he had been re-elected in 2020. All we do know is that no such acts of aggression by authoritarian powers occurred during his first term. As between the Constitution and American primacy in the world, I would say that the latter looks more vulnerable to four more years of democratic government than the former does to four more years of Trump. Robert Menzies believed in a democracy that was firmly rooted in an educated citizenry a vibrant civil society, the rule of law based on private property rights, and a culture of humility. Though the majority may be wrong today, he wrote, courage and patience on the part of those actively engaged in affairs with wisdom which is born of bitter experience will make the majority right tomorrow. There are many reasons to view the state of democracy in the world today with disquiet. But to say that it is doomed is surely absurd. There was far more to fear in 1934 than there is in 2024. And even if mistakes are made in our time, as Menzies said, they can be corrected. There's always 2028 when I am confident another American general election will be held without Donald Trump's name on the ballot. In my most recent book, Doom, Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe, I tried to point out that we human beings are rather too inclined to prophesy doom, the end of the world as we know it when what we really need to do is to improve the way we handle the medium-sized disasters we are much more likely to encounter in our lives. Perhaps it will turn out on November 5th that I'm wrong and that I should have given my book a different subtitle. 
the catastrophe of politics. Perhaps it's not Robert Menzies who'll be vindicated, but Sinclair Lewis. But ladies and gentlemen, at the risk of tempting fate, I am going to side with Menzies and against the prophets of democratic doom. Thank you very much.